Hi guys and welcome to my retro watches. Well, I promised you a video on a jump power and I'm starting this one where I left the other one off. So these are all my jump hour watches, real crazy 70 wacky designs. And in this episode, we're gonna restore this one here in the middle that needs quite a lot of work. Now, the reason I've chosen this one in particular particular is that recently I turned 50 and my wife colluded with some of my friends to get me this high sought after um, John Power watch uh, it's called a lip and they're really interesting because they uh, look well quite interesting on the wrist of course and this one has got a bit of a problem um, I'll try and show it you so as you can see when it's saved, it's, so it's 15 minutes past, but what is it 15 minutes past, 10 or 11? So, and then when it jumps, we are jumping between the hours. So it's got a problem in there and there's a quite tricky mechanism, apparently inside some interesting little springs and the actual hour wheel has a spring in the middle. I'll put a photo up now, which I borrowed off the internet and I've got to figure out how that all works. And because this watch is a bit special and a bit valuable, I didn't want to do it until I'd worked on another jump power just to get some practice. Now this one uh, is similar, but also dissimilar because we haven't got the running seconds and um, we've got a date window, but it is an interesting little 17 joule movement that I can't take the back off. So I'll tell you what, let's cut to the bench anyway. I'll tell you a bit more about it. Let's get it opened up, have a look under the microscope, see if we can see anything obvious, and then we'll strip it down and uh, start the repair. So now we can get a little bit closer up and uh, I can tell you what my grand plans are, um, which in theory, because I don't know how feasible it's going to be just yet, is one, to repair the movement, get the watch running again. Second one is perhaps try to see if I could do anything with this leather strap and actually bring it back to life. It is old and it is a bit dirty um, and it's all twisted where it sat like that forever. But uh, I'm feeling like uh, maybe I can do the full restoration and try and improve the leather because these straps are hard to get hold of. They're really, really wide at uh, the lugs and taper down quite considerably after that then maybe in another video um, I'm looking at the moment at trying to remove the chrome plating because it is just chromed and it is quite uh, poor in places uh, to remove the chrome plating polish it up and then perhaps do some homemade nickel plating um, to bring it back to a bit more life uh, so if that's your bag, then stick around. This will be in two or three parts. I guess the main thing today to focus on is this lovely little movement. So like I say, I'm going to stick it on the microscope and we'll have a look at it a bit closer up there. But essentially, it's a French movement. It's still quite basic, but it is 17 joules. And I believe it's got, it's not a pin pallet. It's got a jeweled pallet. So let's have a look close up and see if we can spot anything obvious. So what I can first tell you is the watch is fully wound. You can see here, this is all I can turn. So let's just have a quick examination and maybe a little prod and a poke as well, why not? So we're looking at some jewels here, let's try and get better light on them. And that one there looks particularly dirty, doesn't it? In fact, the whole movement looks pretty dirty. Look, I can see like, is that on the balance itself? Or is that just on the it's on the regulator pin, but now it's in the hairspring. <laughs> yeah, so the movement is definitely pretty filthy. You can just about see the pallet fork there, look, and the escape and the pallet cock also, which is jeweled. So basic movement, but at the same time, uh, better than most jump powers. Most jump powers have pin pallets, even one jewel movements. So this is high end compared to those. So that's all I can see really. Let's strip it down. I think it's just gonna need a good clean to be honest with you. 
Um, don't think I can show you anything on the dial side that you haven't already seen. Obviously the crystal here is acrylic, it's in a bit of a bad condition. If I'm to plate this, I've got to figure out how to remove that, which should be fun. Um, yeah, there we go. Movements out the case, and that's what we can see on the dial. Typically with most jump powers I ever seem to see is the bits that's hidden are usually quite bad. And that's very typical here. We've got a bit of corrosion and a bit of wear, but I guess it's just rubbed in the case. But obviously that viewing rectangle is pretty decent to be honest with you. So happy so far. Let's get it in a movement holder. Let's let down the main spring and get that dial off. So I've now got to figure out how these discs come off. I don't know whether I can lever it. It certainly doesn't want to come off like that. There we go. I was hoping Rodico would pull that one, but it doesn't. Wow, these are tight. We're in. So I've had a quick look about this date disc and it doesn't appear to come off. So I'm gonna to have to try and strip the plates off first of all, see what's under there. And that makes everything come off. <laughs> I'll be careful because I bet there's some springs. I can see one there. That's interesting because I have no idea how that was loaded. Very interesting. To me it has to have something to do with that, that's the uh, calendar click. Oh, okay, for now, let's take them off. Nice, interesting date wheel. Also, I was going to say it looks like it was riveted on, but it's not. That's handy. Interesting hour wheel. That has something on the hour wheel as well. And then the usual kind of keyless works. Screw, it's being stubborn.
bit of an unusual way for me to take the spring out. And then there's the yoke. And then the setting lever, of course, is held in by a screw, which is on the other side. So I'm going to leave that in for the time being. And let's just get that cannon pinion. Which doesn't want to move. And the good old Presto tool did the work of that for me. I'll leave the shock jewel in place for now. Uh, that will come out at cleaning, this one here. Let's flip it over and have a look at the movement side. Right, this shouldn't cause me too much problems. It looks very similar to other movements I've done before. Straight away, got a nice little click spring there. And uh, it looks very, very familiar to me, this movement. So I think I might have already done one of these or something very similar to it a while ago. Possibly not on the channel. Okay, that's the dangerous part out of the way. This should be left-handed. And sometimes you just have to tighten these screws a little bit before you loosen them. And that way they free up. And now we can get to some of the bridges. And there's the train. So far I've not seen any surprises at all, which is good. And there we are, movement is stripped. And in the words of Radiohead, no alarms and no surprises. Very, very basic, straightforward movement. Okay, we've got that strange uh, date click to figure out on rebuild, but essentially that's it. I'm confident that a clean is all this is going to need to get it going. So let's get it in the cleaning machine.
Okay, it's time to rebuild this movement, but before I do that, I just wanted to say I hope the poor lighting in the disassembly didn't ruin the video too much. I noticed these overhead shots were really, really dazzly bright, and that was an error on my part. I just couldn't quite tell. And um, once you've done it, you've done it. I didn't want to rebuild it and try and fake to, to video it again, so uh, there we go. I say you see the mistakes as they happen when I build, so you also see the mistakes in my editing as well. So let's crack on. I think it's going to be fairly straightforward, this movement, or at least I hope it's going to be. So let's see where it takes us. So greasing the port there with a bit of Seiko S4 grease, because I've got so much of the damn stuff and I uh, need to use it up. But it's good enough for the barrel, it's high friction. Now we're onto the train, so the uh, escape wheel, the pivot on this is absolutely tiny. Finding the hole in the jewel isn't always easy, but there we go. And then we just follow the, the wheels up. Not always easy to find the position in the jewel and you don't want to force anything of course because the last thing you want to do is break a pivot so this is just years of practice really makes it look a lot easier than sometimes it is tiny bit of grease there or a bit of oil should i say 9010 don't really need to do it because i do oil it again on the dial side and there's the center wheel so the train is now in and complete Bit more of the S4, possibly a little bit too much, but I don't think you can go too far wrong. It is the highest friction point probably on the watch really. So we'll now just fit the bridge. And now the train bridge, which always promises to be entertaining. There's a lot of pivots to line up. Always hampered as well by the camera here. Obviously you're looking down at it and that's where my head would normally be. And usually because I'm looking from the side, I can't always tell. We get the blower in here to see if everything's spinning as it should. And that looks kind of okay. So hopefully the pivots are all lined up and we can get the screws in. Hundred percent happy. Just double checking. In with the screws as quickly as possible. So normally I'd screw in one at a time, uh, but just for the video, I tend to put them in a bit quicker than I should. Last thing you want to do is put one or all the screws in place, start screwing, have a slip and then they all go scattering across your bench because then of course you'll never find the damn things and they're easily lost not easily replaced so clean the oiler fresh bit and we're going to get the crown wheel fitted this is for the hand wind mechanism and here's the washer that actually i lost in a uh, disassembly I found it in my Rodico was another part that went missing and I was lucky to find it in there to be honest with you because I hadn't realized it had gone for a while but there we go Rod Rodico always go through your Rodico on occasions guaranteed to find some surprises in there a tiny bit of D5 again just to help with the friction and now we've got to put the screw in and of course it's left-handed thread so we've got to turn it the wrong way in order to tighten that up. And now it's the click mechanism for the ratchet wheel. This is what holds the tension of the spring. So you have this little lever like so, and then a dreaded spring to go in. But this one is dead easy because it doesn't go in under any tension at all, really, as you will see. Look, just fits just like that. Now we can get the ratchet wheel, get it installed. It's got a nice square center hole. 
or squarish, so it locates quite easily. And on with the screw. Always important to keep those two separate. Obviously one's left hand, one's right handed. The last thing you want to do is get them mixed up. And then that's what we want to see. We want to see the train moving. But we do hit a little snag. Okay, there's a problem. I think the spring has moved. And there you can see the spring has jumped its position. Shouldn't be like that. And we'll just reset it. There is a little lip where the bit there goes in so it's obviously just jumped over that I think and as you can see that now works properly so we've got plenty of power going into that train that's really really good news So with the pallet fork in place, we can install the pallet cock. This one's really thin. It's got two location posts, but it's not all that easy and obvious. I have to keep adjusting it and looking at it. Um, seems to want to be always out of position until you put the screw in, I think. So now the best bit for any hobbyist watchmaker, get the balance in, and see if it's going to work. Usually a tricky part to fit, but always the most rewarding, no question. So it's slightly overbanked here, we can just gently fettle it. Oh, 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 oh. We've got a bit of life. We have got a little bit of life. Let's put the screw in. There you go, that doesn't look too bad. Yep, to me, that's beating okay. Am I taking it off the camera? Probably. Yes, there we go. Ah, oh, always so good. It's like starting an engine for the first time, isn't it? You know that you've done everything right and you hope it's not, it's not gonna go bang. And that is working again. So we've taken a dead watch and we've got it working. Uh, we'll check it on the time graph grapher in a bit because we need to do some oiling first. Then we'll go onto the calendar works and those uh, discs and see if we can figure out how to fit those. Here we are on the digital microscope. Uh, a great place for filming oiling. It's not the best place to perform it in my opinion. I do much prefer my optical uh, microscope. I'm using 9010 for all of the uh, jewels that you can see here. And you might notice as well that I use the side of the oiler. So you've, they, it's slightly spade ended. It's so always tilt it to one side and that just gives it a little bit more accuracy. Uh, as you can see there and you can see the oil sort of go into the place it needs to be the uh, the shock jewel there well I've done all of that completely off camera I'm afraid they were quite tricky we're looking down now as well at the uh, pallet fork which again sadly I did it off camera so difficult to oil that on camera with especially with this you need to be really above it and I just can't do it and again a token gesture we can see the <laughs> shock jewel on with the dial side a couple more to do
like I say, all 9010 and just a tiny amount really. Now this is the, the center jewel, which realistically I don't need to oil because I oiled it on the other side if you remember. But I'm a creature of habit, I like to put it there. In part it does help the cannon pinion. And talking of the cannon pinion, we're going to put a bit of D5 on the center post there, as you'll see. And again, that's just to aid the friction of the cannon pinion. Oiling is now complete. So on with that cannon pinion. Get your tweezers, give it a really good push down. Just checking, not happy, boom. But there we go, does take some force sometimes. In with the clutch. And then the winding pinion here, we're just gonna put some grease all over that, liberal amount of grease. Again, high friction area, so don't wanna wear that part out, do we? Slots into place, a bit of grease sticks onto your tweezers. Always got to give them a clean afterwards. Nine oh one oh on that little post there. That's going to be for the minute wheel, and I'm going to put a bit of D five on that one there, which is just for that again that pinion there. Bit more D5, this time for the yoke. Then it's time for the nasty black grease again. Let's put some of that in there. Just trying to use it up, like I say. Uh, liberal amounts, my oiling's not fantastic. Uh, but this is a high friction point again. This is the yoke and the setting lever. So get a bit of decent grease in there if you can. And we'll just make those two ends up. So the yoke spring, tricky looking thing. Always try and hold it with something, whether it be a pair of tweezers, or in my case, I prefer to use pegwood all the time. The last thing you want to do is get these flying away. Some people put them in plastic bags actually, put the whole movement in a plastic bag and do it. And it's sound advice to be fair, you're not likely to lose the spring should it decide to catapult. I've just got experience and therefore it doesn't happen that often, but it does still happen to me occasionally. So on with the minute wheel. And then we just need to get the setting uh, lever spring, which is a real long, complicated part, which is really holding everything else in place as well as acting as that spring. Just the one screw. Apologies again for the shine and glare that's coming off this movement. I'm playing havoc with my camera and my lighting. Uh, this has been the worst video for it, really, um, so I can only apologise. Don't know why it's being so bad, uh, but it is. Must be my cleaning. Maybe I've got it too shiny using clean fluid. And now get the setting lever spring over the setting lever. There we go. Just push it over. Job done. Bit more of the black grease. Can't use too much, can we? There we go. And a bit more, just for good luck. Now we'll just test, make sure it works. So we're getting near the end now. And I just thought I'd show you something which was quite fascinating. So I didn't notice it on strip down, uh, but I've noticed it on rebuild. So of course we have this other part on top of the hour wheel here and it's only got four teeth and um, I dismissed it really didn't think it was anything special until I came to inspecting the parts after cleaning because we have the uh, date uh, 
driver wheel here which will have the fingers on it which knocks over the date wheel and I'll bring that in now and I'll just make sure it's in focus and I was worried I was looking at this under the microscope and I was thinking it's got teeth that's missing it's actually got four teeth missing so I had a bit of a heart attack um, but alas it's got four teeth missing for some quite bizarre reason in a way uh, purely because of the way it interacts with the hour wheel. So if I fit that now. Okay, and I'm going to try to wind on the movement, which is always tricky in this holder. This is the version holder. I've had to use this one um, at this part of the build so I can fit the crown and stem. So I'll try again. So I'm going to try and turn around. I think it's now just come out of position. So yeah, so we're winding on. And there you go. Every pass. It just got snagged there actually because I think it's not engaged properly. That's better. So for every pass it sort of moves a quarter of a turn. And at that point there it would have knocked it over. It's quite fascinating. Never seen that before. Um, but there we go. So we've learned something new. And now of course it's on to the main event which was to fit that spring because we didn't know where the spring came from. Now I have had a, the virtue of course of looking back through my video and trying to uh, just see. Just need to quickly put some oil on this post here. So this part is the, uh, the dendant, if that's how you pronounce it, for the calendar wheel. So here is the calendar wheel and then this will, once in position, sit in between the teeth of the arrow wheel itself. But of course we have that spring, if you remember, the spring that came out. And I've deliberated over this, look back through the video, and sort of kind of got a glimpse of where it was going to go. And this is a movement that you have to fit this part first and then that bit afterwards. So a bit of jiggery pokery to get it to line up. And as you can see, I'm having trouble lining it up. And that's because I've got that in the wrong hole.
there, finally. So I'll fit the two screws and then I'll show you where or where I think the spring needs to go. So we have this sort of figure eight part here cut out and we have to put the spring in there. So this is a delicate operation. But as far as I can tell, the hook end goes in like so. And then that end goes in there like that. And from looking back at the old video, that is how it looked like it fitted. So now it's in, we should be able to manually wind on and yes there we go hope you saw that I'm a little bit off camera so we're in business the spring is fitted all we're now got to do is fit the uh, hour and minute wheel or disc in order to do that though I've got to think a little bit laterally so here is the case, which you can't see, here's the case. So it's going to be sitting in there. This side is the date window, and over here is the time. So if it's going to click over at 12, we need to get the disc on, I believe, at 12, kind of across. So I just want to make sure that I wind it on just again. So it's kind of there, I just have those pesky dial screws that I didn't undo. And yes, that's as good as it's going to be for 12, I think. I think that looks okay. And uh, <laughs> it's stuck. So what I can actually see here, you won't be able to see this very easily because the camera won't focus. 
the discs aren't level, or at least the minute one isn't. Let's just see where we are for date change. I think I'm going to have to possibly do this again. That's not bad, is it, actually, come to think of it? So I'm going to call that a win. So there we go. The movement is complete. Yes, the dial needs a little bit of work, um, but there's nothing I can do with that other than a bit of Rodico. So let's concentrate now on trying to do something with that strap because I really want to try and restore that as good as I can. So let's cut to that now. Okay, this is going to be an interesting part of the video. I've never done this before, but I'm going to try to restore this leather strap. It is in pretty poor condition, very dirty, very old, bit dry. Obviously this bit is completely bent as well. And you might say, well, that's pretty disgusting. Why on earth would you want to restore that? And I think the same, quite frankly. But with these jump power watches with these straps, this is 28 millimeters at the lug to lug. And down here, it's about 13. So it's a huge taper. And that's obviously to make it look a bit better on the wrist. And you can't buy straps with this taper. I've looked, can't find them anywhere. So it's a case of either buying one with a much lesser taper, which I'll probably do in the end, or try and see what we can do with this. So what I've got is some intensive cleaner and also some leather conditioner. Now I've used this before for my uh, seats in my car. So I'm hoping it might work on here. And the idea is really, it's just rub it on, let it dry in a little bit, then rub it off and uh, see what the results are going to be. I'm guessing the cleaner might need to be done a few times. And then of course the conditioner again, a few times as well. I'm gonna use some baby wipes uh, because they're a little bit damp as well. So I'll put some gloves on and have a little go. So I'm going to start with the uh, the worst one really. I've got a lot of cleaner. So I'm just going to apply it and then try and rub it in in a minute once I've got a, a lot on. As I say, really don't know if this is going to work, but it's worth a try. I'm going to keep doing this. I've got to let it dry, let it soak in, then wipe it again. Do that a few times, and then I'll come back and show you how good or bad it is. So these have now dried. Still look pretty grotty. Um, certainly that side, but it is clean in theory. The leather's become a bit more supple. It's lost a bit of that fold over, which is nice. And we can see that it's lost a lot of its color. And the plan now, will, first of all, is to use the uh, nourisher or the conditioner and get some moisture back into the leather. So I'll do a couple of coats of that, let that all dry off and then the grand idea is to use good old fashioned boot polish. If it's good enough for your shoes, it's gonna be good enough for a strap and I'm hoping it'll get this more black. Um, don't know whether it works, I've never tried it before, but uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, as they say.
I'm going to leave those now and see if that actually soaks in. It might be too much. I have no idea, but they are very, very dry and it is skin at the end of the day. So let's get as much moisture into those as possible. So that's still soaking in, but what I now want to do is try something with a big, heavy piece of steel. And I'm basically going to put the straps, I'm trying to see if you can see that. Put the straps in like that. Let me zoom out. There we go, you can see it now. And I'm going to put a big weight on top of it. And I'm going to leave them like that for a little while just to see if that will flatten them out a little bit. Uh, maybe a few hours or so, who knows? Probably won't do anything, but it's worth a try. Now it's been conditioned and squashed. Still a little bit bent, but uh, it's a lot better. It wants to say flat now for a start. And it actually has enhanced the color a little bit, but of course it's now time to use the uh, Kiwi shoe polish that I've been using all my life actually for shoes. So I have no idea if it's going to work on a watch strap uh, or how realist, real, how I'm going to apply it, should I say. Boots are a lot easier, but I've got a brush. I'm hoping really this is going to change it for the better. So I'll work at these two and um, hopefully we'll get it back to a shine. about half an hour later that's all been buffed up i've gone back to the green mat because the blue mat was causing lighting issues uh, and there we go what do you think i think it's come out all right to be honest with you so a hell of a lot better and of course you'll see it on the end result in the daylight as well which will no doubt show it off to its full potential I do think perhaps i could still go over it with another coat maybe some of the uh, clear um, polish that you can get as well that might actually help it long term so just got to dress the watch up i've gone to cousins and of course you can't buy one buckle you've got to buy four or five should i say so i bought five buckles for a couple of pounds so we've got a buckle to fit the end there and then i also need some stays so i've got some basic 16 millimeter ones here so i'll dress all that up and lastly of course spring bars so these and the original spring bars, look at the state of these. I've seen many a spring bar from restorations, never that bad. So treat them to brand new ones. Got a whole pack of 28 millimeters of which I'll use two for this watch and the remaining eight will sit there for absolute ever, definitely. So we'll dress that up and we'll go back and see the watch. Right, here we are on the time grapher, and I'll just warn you, they might hear some loud bangs or whistles in the background. It's Diwali here today, and uh, the fireworks are going off like crazy, so I'm trying to film in between all of that. So, this movement is an FE233-69, and uh, the lift angle is 49 degrees. 
hence it's set there. And I've got it all um, tuned in. And you might be thinking, well, why have you set it at minus 14 seconds a day? And that's because, weirdly in this one, dial down as it is, seems to be the worst position. Wow, that was a proper firework. So if we move that, for instance, into crown down, here we go, the traces at the bottom here, we get a bit of a smoother ride, basically. As you can see there, I'm sure the rate's gonna level out. So actually, it's, it's really, really accurate according to that. Uh, again, we can put it to, if I just do it right, crown up. Crown up to me is always a very stressful position. Just let it catch up with itself. There we go. So minus 12 again, but maybe I could give it a better nudge. So lastly is dial up. Another massive firework. Okay, dial up is now presenting itself with a minus. Okay, so only minus five. So it looks like really, truth be told, I've got to give it another little tiny nudge to get it into the plus. But that said, I think it's running pretty damn well considering this thing was a non-runner to start with. Uh, certainly had a lot of action in its life, but it's still got plenty of life left to give. Uh, so there we go. Let's cut to having some nice uh, videos. You can see the finished watch. So here we are out in the daylight and you can see the watch in all of its vintage glory. Now this is a watch that was completely unloved. It had been discarded almost. It's probably been sitting around for decades. I've certainly had it for maybe three years now and um, had to get around to doing it. I've got a fascination with jump hours. I haven't serviced that many at all and this one had to be a good candidate in light of the fact of getting that uh, lip uh, watch for my birthday and that's the kind of iconic one that everybody wants it has this type of style where the strap comes over the top of the case and actually gives you that small little rectangular viewing window so what do you think do you think it was worth all that effort uh, do you like what i've done to this watch shall we leave it as it is now or should we continue this further there is an argument to strip all that chrome off the case and try to do some nickel plating. I've never done that before, but it is of interest to me at the moment. Plenty of guys are doing it in my Facebook group, so uh, I want to jump on the bandwagon. So this could be a contender for that. Um, but after restoring that strap as well, it kind of gives me, well, I need to keep it vintage. You leave your comments down below. If enough of you think it should be replated, then perhaps this will be the video that I will do on that watch next. Um, it had a great movement inside. I think uh, often these have like a pin palette, uh, one jaw movement. So this one is a step up. I think it's an old movement, this uh, FE um, brand. But nevertheless, it's got lots of jewels and it's got a jewel palette fork. So it is of a higher quality and thus you get more accuracy on the time grapher. So there's one big thing on this watch that I have not said throughout the entire video. Some of you may have noticed it, some of you might not. This isn't actually a true jump hour watch because certainly the hour disc is not jumping into position on every hour hour and that is what they should be doing all this is doing is rotating the discs uh, as it goes along um, so not strictly a jump power i'm going to class it as that because it still looks like one and uh, i don't know what category you'd put it into otherwise to be quite frank uh, here is a shot of it on my wrist i actually like the look of it you've got to try with these watches on like i say with this integrated strap over the top it's unusual look but when it's on your arm, it is actually quite nice. But it is for me. I do certainly like the unusual. So, guys, tell me what you think of this watch. Do you do you enjoy this video? Do you like what I did with it? Do you like the, uh, the, the strap restoration? Please leave all of your comments down below. 
I will read every one of them. I'll try to reply to as many as I can. I look forward as well to seeing what you think. Do apologise again for the poor lighting or the dazzling lighting uh, or reflections that we got in this video. It's, um, well, what can I say? It is, it's just cleaned it's that well that it's too shiny. <laughs> Perhaps that's, that's it. Okay, that's the end of the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed this restoration, if you can call it a restoration, of this uh, door valve jump power. Not that it's a real jump power, let's face it, it is just a rotating disc watch. But there we go, another one to add to the collection and another watch saved, which is what it's all about. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, leave your comments below, of course. Consider subscribing if you're new to the channel. If you want to support the channel in any way, shape or form, there is a tool page on my website, a link down below. If you're getting into this hobby, you can click on some of those, buy those tools. It's affiliate links, so they're just tools, maybe tools that I'm using or I recommend, and I get a little bit of kickback for that, of course. Equally, you could buy a T-shirt. So we have a T-shirt like this, or we've got a T-shirt like this, or lastly, my favourite, we've got a T-shirt like this one. So there you go guys, um, if you uh, liked this jump power then look up here because you will see a video of my collection, albeit it's a little bit out of date now, and there's a video down below here which is for the Secura jump power that I also restored fairly recently. I will see you very soon in a new video, bye for now.